Good afternoon. I'm Adele Johnson, Executive Director of the Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia. Welcome to this afternoon's program on racial inequities. You know, here at the museum, our mission is to preserve stories that inspire. So we tell the untold stories, the undertold stories, the forgotten stories about the struggles, triumphs, and contributions of our ancestors. And we also highlight and celebrate the heroes of today. Guess what? I am here at the Black History Museum because we have reopened. Um, so come on down and see us. We have our expanded health and safety measures. We've intensified our sanitizing. Um, so we have all of that in place and we would love to see you. I'm sitting in front of our featured exhibition, Paradox of Liberty, Slavery at Jefferson's Monticello, which has been extended until November. We all know that Thomas Jefferson was our third president. He was the father of the Declaration of Independence and a Virginia governor. However, what you may not know, what's really not been talked about very much until recent years, is that Thomas Jefferson owned 607 enslaved children, women, and men over his lifetime. But you know what? This exhibition is not about him. It does not focus on Thomas Jefferson. Instead, it gives life, it gives voice to those 607 enslaved people who have built and maintained Monticello. So come visit, read their stories, see the 300 artifacts, hear the oral histories from their descendants. We are absolutely honored to share this exhibition with you because it offers a more complete and inclusive history of Virginia and America. Today we're excited because this is our third segment of Voices for Change, a community conversation with the overarching goal of being a catalyst, a catalyst for conversation and action. We want you to take time to reflect on who you are, what you stand for, and what we individually as well as jointly can do to make our future better. It is the reason, this is the reason that the Black History Museum is hosting this series. In a few minutes, you'll hear from several people sharing their personal experiences and perspectives. We believe that each of us has a story and that sharing our personal stories will foster productive dialogue and understanding. Today, we are focusing on racial inequities, being treated unfairly for no reason. When you are treated unfairly day after day, week after week, year after year, the impact is cumulative. So what can we do? As many have said recently, silence is not an option. We can't tell you what to do, but we can tell you that each of us, each of us has a role and a responsibility. If we don't do something, we'll find ourselves in the same place tomorrow as we are today. And is that where we wanna be? I don't think so. During the program, we wanna hear from you. So we will pose questions on the screen, then your combined responses will be shown as a percentage. Please participate because we want to know what you're thinking too. Again, today's theme is racial inequities. So let's begin. Racial equity, in my estimation, is at first and at its heart, a social and humanitarian concept that when achieved is reflected in public policy. That is to say that when we all view each other as human first with the same value, with the same worth, the same needs and the same feelings and emotions, our public policies necessarily will reflect that sameness 
in all the public policy areas that we deem important to the quality of human existence. Whether that is in education, in economic opportunity, and access to health care, in voting, and again, every facet of public policy that is important to a high quality of life and liberty. The phase one findings of the commission involved a look back in an effort to shape the look forward. We looked back in the sense that we collected, reviewed, and identified the actual laws of the early and mid 20th century that collectively were Jim Crow and collectively were massive resistance. We recommended each of those acts of assembly, those laws that were still on the books to the governor for repeal. They have been repealed. In phase two, we look at the here and now of Virginia law and try to discern as best we can what legal barriers or constructs are in current law in Virginia that continue to hurt black people and other people of color despite the apparent embracing of equal opportunity. We know that equal opportunity doesn't exist uniformly for all racial groups. But what in the law might create these continuing disparities or contribute to them? This commission in phase two is attempting to find that out and to recommend to the governor tools to get rid of those factors that continue to contribute to racial disparities. I think the first thing that we can do to start making sure that people aren't treated unfairly because of race is having these conversations and recognizing that people are treated differently in this country based on the color of their skin. Um, but the sooner that we can start leaning into the discomfort of that and having beneficial conversations around that, the sooner that we can start enacting policy to protect people, to make sure that race um, is not a discriminating factor. Um, and just conversations in general around this topic are difficult, but are so necessary to move us forward. So now think about those folks who know their representatives or those folks who are part of city government or making policy, but they attend white steeple churches or big steeple churches who have a lot of power, a lot of money, a lot of access. Um, and it's just the tricky thing about once you have power, whether you're conscious of it or not, right? The, the goal is to try to create systems that enable you to keep that power to protect your own, but not just protect your own, make sure that your own have the best and the most and that they can um, continue the legacy and um, they will never feel threatened or um, they'll never lose their power essentially. Um, and off you go, then you're just off and running because um, it's all about continuing that um, that power, basically. So then you start to create systems that institutionalize that power for one group of people over another or over other groups of people. Uh, and that's just one example. The first time that I I remember realizing that blacks were treated differently was when I was about five years old. Um, I, grew up, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and my mother and I were headed to the mall. And so we were walking from the parking lot over to the mall crossing the major street that was there. And there was this car that drove by and they yelled out the word nigger. And at that time, I really didn't know what nigger meant, but I could tell that it was something bad just by the the posture that my mother had and, and just the expression on her face. I knew something was wrong. I also knew that this person yelling it out was not yelling out a compliment and that, you know, they were definitely upset about something or angry about something. And it had nothing to do with us having any type of um, car incident. Like there wasn't anything when we parked, there wasn't anything unusual when we were driving down the street. So I knew that it was something that they felt that they could say to us 
just based on whatever they saw. And it had nothing to do with anything that we did. Um, what was your first experience in, in knowing that you were black and, we, and, and blackness was different? Well, I can remember when I was six or seven years old and uh, there was this pool in our town and there was only one pool in our town. And I would, we would as kids drive by that pool and hear all kids just playing and playing, just having fun. And it was really loud. And I just remember just wanting to really go to that pool. And one day we were driving home and when we drove home, we had to pass by that pool. And um, I just remember asking my mom, you know, mom, you know, mom, can, can we go to the pool? Mom, can we can we go to the pool? And, and she was like, she responded. She said, boy, you know, they don't like let black people in, in that pool. And again, like, I just did not know. I, I didn't understand that, like. At, a, at six, I couldn't understand, like, why not? Like, and I didn't even, I don't even remember questioning my mom as to why not. Like, why can't we go into the pool? You know, why, what is, what is black people, why, why is, I was just really confused as, as a six-year-old. Um, so, you know, that, that was my first uh, experience with coming to this understanding that blacks were somehow different from whites. Virginia that I grew up in was a Virginia that had monuments on every corner, where the textbook that I learned in fourth grade Virginia history called it the war between the states and said that enslaved people were happy. It was a place where I knew which pool I could go to, I knew which school uh, I could go to, I knew which neighborhood I could go to. And, and how do you begin to unwire those, those beliefs and attitudes that you've been hardwired to believe? So how do you do it? You know, I think that we're, you know, it's not about, and I'm sorry, I, you, you can't go to a diversity retreat and do a half day and be inoculated when you're grown up in, in, our, in my position in life. And the tough thing is to realize that this is the personal work you have to do every day. And it's hard, you need to read, you need to read everything you can find to read, to make sure, to begin to think about where, where does this, all this privilege rest? And, why you and how did it happen and how is it structured it's listening to people that that you trust who who talk about the challenges of their own personal lives because those experiences are not going are not your experience and the only way you're going to understand that is actually to listen and to process and spend time thinking about what can I do? What can I do to, to begin the process of unwiring all of this and understanding that you're going to fail? That every day you're going to, you're not going to be fully aware of some of the biases that you hold because they're in.
Several of the latest confrontations have involved white citizens calling police on African Americans engaged in typical everyday activities, including a 12-year-old mowing lawns near Cleveland, Ohio, two men barbecuing at a public park in Oakland, California, or this eight-year-old girl selling bottled water without a permit outside the San Francisco Giants ballpark. The woman who called girl, police here being water. captured on cell phone video posted by the girl's girl. mother. Oh, you can hide all you want. The whole world gonna see you, boo. Yeah, and um, illegally selling water without a permit? Yeah. On my property. It's not your property. The woman who made the call later apologized and denied her actions were racially motivated. Most of the incidents took place outside and in public and were caught on video that often went viral. While none of those incidents resulted in arrests or charges being filed, they filed other high-profile confrontations, including one in May that took a much more violent turn. Police in Warsaw, North Carolina, responded to a call from Waffle House employees over an alleged argument with a black patron. An officer slammed 22-year-old Anthony West into a wall and choked him. They said West, who had taken his sister to her high school prom earlier that night, was uncooperative. He was later charged with disorderly conduct and resisting arrest. The CEO of Waffle House later apologized to West privately. And in early April, two black men were arrested in a Philadelphia Starbucks when employees called police because the men had taken a table without ordering anything. The men were later released and settled with the city for $1 each and a pledge to establish a program for young entrepreneurs. As a female Asian American entrepreneur who started a business nearly 40 years ago in Central Virginia, it was difficult gaining access to CEOs or anyone else in top management. At the time, there were far fewer women, much less women of color, who held my position. At first, I felt alienated and alone. So it was very important to get involved with such organizations as what is now called Carolina, Virginia Minority Supplier Development Council and the Metropolitan Business League. These groups provided emotional and professional support, helping to create networks, share ideas, and attract business. It was also crucial to get certified through the federal and state minority programs that provided development tools and accessibility to the marketplace. There are wide disparities in education, healthcare, business opportunities, and criminal justice throughout all of our communities. It begins with the schools, many of which are segregated racially and socioeconomically. These schools and their students are the ones that need additional resources the most, but are consistently denied. The lack of a satisfactory education sets a potentially lifelong course toward other forms of racial inequity. Racial equity for me is when the playing field is level and we all get to start from the same starting line and no one is disadvantaged based on their sex, their color, their gender, their sexual orientation. We all are human beings and we all have something to contribute. And when we are all treated as such, then we can all play a part in this society. Yes, I've experienced racial inequities throughout my life and particularly being in the service industry with a number of uh, uh, bad experiences that have, uh, that could make you a little uh, jaded. One of the ones that stood out for me the most in my career was when I was working with a uh, client who did not trust African-Americans to be um, capable of doing banking for them. I only worked with this client for over the phone, so they couldn't detect by my voice what race I came from. And we would worked together for at least a couple of years until one day he decided he wanted to meet me. But prior to that, he would always talk about how the monkeys were running the city administration or running the post office. And he just always had disparaging remarks and he thought he was talking to a another Caucasian. So one day when he wanted to sign some loan papers, I invited him to come 
and sign the papers in person rather than go to another branch or uh, do it by mail. When he came into the office and he asked to meet me, and this was in the early 90s, and he asked to meet me and he had to walk back to my desk, which was a long lobby. And I was the only person sitting at the desk and he was, you could see his face changing as he was coming towards me. And when he got to my desk, he looked at me, he says, are you Victor Branch? And I said, I'm so happy to meet you, Mr. So-and-so. He was completely devastated that he had been uh, talking that way to me about minorities. And he sat in his chair and he turned his chair sideways because he could not even look me in my eyes because he, he felt so guilty and ashamed for what he had done all that time. So I spent some time tutoring at the Albemarle Charlottesville Regional Jail and I think that one of the most important ways that we can address uh, how Americans are treated unfairly due to race is by recognizing how we cr disproportionately criminalize people of color, particularly black Americans and black individuals. Uh, and so I think that we need to be cognizant of how they are criminalized and do what we can to um, combat that criminalization and contextualize it. To combat racial inequities ongoing, a person can speak out when the circumstance arises and ask the person who is making this prejudgment to explain why they are making that judgment, have them determine why they have the problem. You don't. It is not our problem to solve. It is a problem of the historical learning of a whole race of people. And it goes through families, it goes through education system. You have to confront each circumstance and ask them to define why they think that way. Let them wrestle with it. I have lived a lifetime of racial inequities, which have both assisted me and hindered me on my journey. It just is. We need to accept and understand that those inequities, current inequities, have historical roots that run deep and spread wide and the effects have been persistent. We need to look inward, become self-aware of any manner in which we might personally perpetuate inequity even on a less than conscious basis. And finally, we need to actively and affirmatively support public policies and actions that reflect the humanity, the value, and the worth of all people on the same playing field. Some actions we can take to combat racial inequities are, oh my gosh, so many things we could do. We could overhaul our school system, overhaul our education so that all the money and school districts doesn't go to the wealthiest neighborhoods, um, the wealthiest zip codes. We could overhaul our policing. We could reimagine public safety from the ground up. Um, we could stop racial profiling in our criminal justice system. You know, I feel like what we've done is, is try to be honest with them about situations that have occurred so that they know that racial inequalities exist. And we've even talked to them about like what they should do if they see something. Um, and I'm so proud of, of our, our oldest daughter who is 11. And um, in her room, she has a sign 
a quote, I think, from Martin Luther King about the importance of speaking up when you see something that's wrong. And so I think that's a really, you know, a really key quality that, that we're looking for our kids. You need to go to places that you've never been, maybe make you uncomfortable, that are exciting and wonderful places in your own community, but they're not your places that you've ever been. And it's okay. Go to a great restaurant on Brooklyn Park Boulevard or in Southside. Um, you know, you've been going to that Irish festival a lot. Why don't you go to a different place? Um, go to places and events. Go visit a church that's not your faith tradition. These are all things that are free, open, that we all should do every day to find ways to put ourselves actively in a place where we can learn about someone else and in the process learn more about our own selves and our own biases and our own baggage that we go through life with. Change does not happen simply with ideas and rhetoric. Change occurs when policy and systems are radically altered. Get involved, get educated, get out the vote. We can all bring about change and make a difference. Thank you so much for participating in our program. You know, racial inequity is a choice. You can treat people fairly or not. So decide today, how will you be a voice for change? And remember that silence is not an option. As always, we invite you to send your comments to us as well as post them on social media about today's program. And to learn more about the Black History Museum or to see the program again, please go to our website, blackhistorymuseum.org. See you next time.